We're at uh, Bishop Vale Mall. I got arrested just down there, actually, when I was a kid. But um, yeah, we were just kind of little scumbags, but um, hearts were true. Welcome, 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 welcome! <laughs> yeah, if I'm, if I'm focusing, man, 100%. I pick up stories and I turn them into songs and I go somewhere else and I drop them off. You know, that's sort of how it kind of works. This year, I don't think there's been a week where I haven't been away somewhere. Lots of back and forths and round and round, ups and downs. He actually is the troubadour. He is the hardest working musician in the country. And I think he's been that for a long time. And I don't think anyone else wants that title. <laughs> Well, when you grow up kind of a bit working class and you start moving to the arts, there's always a bit of shame about that. <laughs> you know what I mean? You always feel like, you always feel like you've you really got to be to doing something. Yeah, yeah, totally. Who's from Gore? Yeah. Storytelling is the great skill that you seem to enjoy. That came out of, you know, your one dude in an acoustic guitar, which is not a unique thing, let's be real. So I kind of figured out you can give the song some context. And if the story's good, if the story's funny, if the story connects or lands, then they'll be more interested in listening to what's happening in the song. Oh, we're gonna do this song now. It's called Air Jordans. And if you don't know, Air Jordans is a kind of Nike basketball boot. And when we were kids, it was the number one shoe that we wanted to steal from your doorstep, from your car, from uh, your feet if you were small enough. That was the one. We moved over here when I was about 10. When you think about, you know, all the roads going home, <laughs> I guess they sort of end up back here. <laughs> and uh, it also mentions my mum. And when we were kids, everyone hated my mum, including me, because <laughs> she yelled at everyone all the time for literally everything and nothing. My friends would be biking past the house and she'd come running up. And that, but oh fuck your mom. I'm like, I know, man, I'm sorry, you know. But when she died, all my pals showed up at um, her funeral and they all said that she was the only one that gave a shit about them. She was abandoned as a baby. She got the name Dawn because she was found at Dawn Mount because it was a Mount Victoria. She grew up in orphanages, foster homes. She couldn't walk till she was eight. She had like big, you know, those big sort of 50s calipers and things. The woman who fostered her, who I call my grandma, she got my mum out of Sunnyside when she was 13, 14, because she just fostered hundreds of kids. She's got like the Queen Service Medal from fostering all of these kids. And she said, out of all of them, my mum had the worst life. She got married when she was 16 and her husband killed himself. It was real tragic shit. And then she had a daughter, but um, she adopted her out. Yeah, and so, and then just me. And I showed up, you know, yeah, a little bit down the line. My dad split when I was pretty young. I don't know, five. He actually had another, a whole other family. He worked on fishing boats and stuff, and then he was like, um, oh, I'm going to sea, but he's just going to live with his other kids. And then he just sort of disappeared. And then I saw him again. I was bunking school, my last year of school. And um, he was walking down the street. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's my dad. So I jumped off the bus, I was like, <laughs> I tapped him on the shoulder, I was like, Richard, and he turned around. And I'm like, it's me, Adam, I'm your son. <laughs> I was fucking that out of it. I was just sad for my mum, because my mum was really upset when I told her about it. Because he really wanted it talk and connect and, you know, and I sort of said to him, I was like, well, where have you been, you know? And so I just was like, okay, well, I'll just give him a year where I don't talk to him as sort of like a kind of a one for my mum, you know? But he died in that time, so yeah, we never really got to him. Um, what was it? Yeah. Now you got two girls in a partner, backyard around the fire, laughter. Take it easy, smoke a little weed. 
Well, it's not a bad life or a bad scene. Yeah, this is my street where I grew up, Chelmwood Crescent. We didn't have a car in my family. My, my mom didn't drive till I was about 16, maybe. Yeah, and even then when she would drive, she wouldn't, she wouldn't cross certain roads. So basically we could go to the supermarket. That was about it. Do like, you remember being hungry? No, nah, not, not really. I mean, no, nah, I mean. It was always something, eh? Yeah, totally. You know, if you eat an ice cream cones for dinner or whatever. But it was always funny, like, when the Salvation Army would come around, they'd bring you, like, weird things. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like, here's a meal pack. It's not like none of that Hello Fresh shit or whatever. Like, it was just, yeah, like, here's a box of, like, weird biscuits that never got released or something, you know what I mean? So your house. Yeah, man. We moved over here, as I said, when I was about 10. You could swap state houses. So we managed to do that. and. This house seemed so nice. My mum, she had a lot of mental health problems. She'd do this thing where she'd sort of like revert to like a, a child, you know, like a two-year-old. And I'd sort of like be taking care of her. And I'd buy the groceries, do the things. And then when I, I couldn't, there wasn't any more money or whatever, then I'd call someone and like her boyfriend at a time or whatever, and they'd come and look after her. And then she'd come back again and go again. So that was a bit of a pattern. There's a lot of, drama and but people knew that oh, my mum you could count on her a little bit you know yeah 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 you know someone one of my friends showed up on my doorstep you know they've been their mum had been smacked around and she just showed up and she was a little kid and she's blood on it like real heavy stuff but she knew that she could come to my mum you know so that has a real real power and a real value you know my mother died two weeks ago and you boys said she helped you grow And of that she would have been so proud My grandma said about my mum was that she only ever wanted to love and she just didn't quite have the skills to do that. And that, that's totally true. And once I figured that out, I had no issues with my mum at all. I just totally loved her and whatever the stresses were or whatever the problems had been. No. Just doing what she could. Yeah, totally. But I wasn't ever meant to be a folk singer that wasn't uh, where I was heading in my life. It's not what my mum wanted for me. She didn't have any expectations that I was going to be a doctor or a lawyer or anything like that. She, um, she wanted me to be a professional rugby league player. <laughs> it was my dream. I mean, I didn't really know what else. I was, I was like, I was like I'm join the army, I play league, go to jail. <laughs> that was like my, probably my three picks. You know, and all these kids, all my guys, all my friends, like, you know, from real messy lives. And it was a real focus for us. Adam. Hey, Adam. Lee. Lee, nice to meet you. I've been running the karaoke down the club rooms 10 years too long. That's me right there. Oh, yeah. Really long. Right back. Oh, yeah, scumbag. <laughs> we're all, we're, what we always used to do was break into that bar and throw the bottles of rum out the window. <laughs> Oh, oh, right. Everyone used to do that. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. All right, I thought that. This one year, I won Player of the Year and Sportsman of the Year for the Marist Western Suburbs Rugby League Club. Thank you very much. But it meant something to me, man, and I, I had this thing, and I looked over at my mom, and she's sitting in the club rooms, and she had tears in her eyes. Oh, tonight. Oh, tonight. Oh. Maybe the last person who got it kept it. <laughs> so Hemi. Hemi, yep, Hemi's still around. Yeah, he was like my hero. And Hemi Weehong, he lived on my street. And he had played professional rugby league. And he meant the world to us, a lot of us. And uh, I went round to his house one day, knocked on his door. He said, oh, come in, Adam. He sat down. I said, you know, Hemi, do you think I've got what it takes? And he was like, no. We're at Burnside High, the home of my many splendid defeats. I ended up in, I guess, the top stream class. I was like this giant guy with this red mullet. 
What's your name? Azariah. Azariah. I'm Adam. Nice to meet you. When I was a kid, my nickname was Az. Yeah, that's my nickname too. Too much, really? Yeah. When I was there, you had these forms that if you did music lessons, you just handed in this form to your teacher and it told you what time the music lesson is so you could leave class. And I found those forms and I stole them all and filled them in wrong, fakely. And yeah, maybe for about seven or eight months, there wasn't a class that I didn't leave early or come later to. Thank you, sir. Too much, to bro. Awesome. That was too good. I got to get out of here, man. That was too good. And I got caught and I had to go see one of the music teachers there and he was going to give me the punishment. And he asked me if I liked music. And of course I, I did. Like that was my whole everything. And he was like, well, do you play? And I was like, nah, nah. Like, well, do you want to? And I was like, what? Yeah, what, what do you want to play? And I was like, well, I want to play the bass like Steve Harris from Iron Maiden. And he's like, okay, well, do you have a bass? And I'm like, no. And he goes, well, you can use the school's one and I'll organize the lessons for you. And I'm like, what? He was the bass player um, and he wasn't a very good bass player either. He stood on the side of the stage and just held that side of the stage firm and played and looked scary. So at this sign here, on my um, last day of high school, came and we ripped off the SIPE and it just said Burn High School, which was kind of one of my favorite moments. But then over the years, uh, it's when he moved into folk, that's when he started actually singing his own songs. And uh, yeah, no, I have an acoustic guitar. Where do you go? Oh, well, I'm gonna go hang out with Waylon and Willie and the boys and we're gonna go to Nashville and we're all gonna sing songs together and it's gonna be a beautiful thing. Pretty soon, pretty immediately, I figured out, well, this is all wrong. And this is not where I'm meant to be at all, you know? And when I came back to New Zealand, I, it just was very clear to me that this was where I was from and this is what I wanted to sing about. People keep telling me about this guy, this guy who kind of loved the same music that I love, kind of the country folk music. No one else was really into that back then. They thought we were kind of weirdos and that we should meet. And we met each other and immediately played our first show together that night. And I was like, well, I sort of have this idea that of this band that just doesn't do anything else, that we just quit all their jobs and we just play music no matter what, no matter where, and no matter how, and we just do that. That's sort of my plan. And she was just up for it, man. The idea was that we wanted to be a local band everywhere. You know, so we go to New Plymouth, it felt like when we were there, it felt like we were a local band, you know? I mean, we were making stuff up as we went along. There was uh, no handbook for us. <laughs> so we did a lot of things the hard way, probably. Yeah. We played a lot, you know, hundreds of shows. It's been a decade now, isn't it? No, man, it's been like nearly two decades. It's been 16 years. Thank you, Elise, thank you. Mostly if I'm at home, I'm in a catatonic state. <laughs> and recovery. Just full of stress and, um, yeah. You got a degree in American studies? Well, I have a degree that I never signed off on graduated, but I, I passed all the things. Is he under the degree too? Oh, uh, French. Not the language, but I read all the books, you know, so yeah, we can, uh, you know, Albert Camus and... Adam does, I suppose, a couple hundred shows a year, um, which is an insane amount of shows. Like he had a show on last Friday night and then the next night he's playing at a bar, you know, and then the next night he's playing at someone's, you know, party or wedding. Didn't you do all your organising, Adam? Uh, yeah, everything. I do all the booking, the logistics, the planning, the poster making, the, uh, yeah, write the songs, <laughs> do the whole thing, do the driving, you know what I mean? 
do the sound quite a lot, set, every, you know, set all the stuff up. Other people have tried to help, but it's impossible to keep up. It's really hard to keep up with him. But one thing I would say is he's, he's generous to a fault, but it's actually to a fault. He's forever kind of like giving it all away. That's giving his heart away, giving his, giving his money away. Getting rich hasn't been a priority. I can't even, it hasn't even crossed my mind. I mean, I work hard and I do my best to pay for everything from my own labour, but also have a lot of grace from the people in my band and the people that support us. And I try to avoid funding applications and those sorts of things. And I really believe in public funding for the arts. Like I really, I think that's, that's a belief I have. Um, but the money doesn't come from people with money, as far as I can figure. Yeah. The money comes from pokey machines and scratchies and, you know. I do use the word Calvinist to describe him a bit because he's got this incredible drive because I, I think that comes from, like, not quite believing in yourself. Your life wasn't always joyful when you're little? Well, Whose is, really? Well, well, some people, I'm sure. Uh, look, OK, look, man, I, yeah, I had some pretty significant uh, assaults on me when I was pre pretty young. Um, and, then also, and, then, and then I had a really, my second stepfather, amazing, my first stepfather, not so good. Like, real, that, yeah. And there was sexual and physical, um, mm. but, yeah, it's... Well, this, stuff like that sits in you, and it sits in you, and it sits in you, and it sits in you, yeah. and it informs all kinds of things. Yeah. So, you know, I'd, I was very angry kid, really. Yeah. You know, I could be really violent and, you know, just, you know, and that's... You know, when it's all pushing in, like, I've just, that's, you know, that's it. Like, yeah. not in a, um, you know, I've never perpetuated that abuse forward like that. But, you know, if I'm in a bar and someone <laughs> is, yeah, that, that's when it'll come out. You know what I mean? When someone's being a tosser. Yeah, probably. It's not even a thought. It just, that's what comes out, you know? Mm. And that's... That's, you know, I've had, that's scary, you know, and awful. I got told that um, you have these two responses to traumatic things, you fight or you flight, you know what I mean? Or you go inwards and, yeah. and I'm a fighty person, you know? And like everything that I do, all the manic running around, the work, everything like that, it's me trying to like outrun or stand down all this other stuff right here, um, you know? I can read a book. I'm pretty, you know, I've been around. I like to talk to people. I've learned different things. I'm, you know, as educated as anyone else, I guess, you know, and, and I'm sensitive and I'm a folk singer and all those stuff, but there's, um, but there's still all this other stuff that just need to get figured out, you know, just so I can, feel like kind of a whole person and be a whole person to other people, probably. Both catch the same bus City blue line With your red hair Me with mine You won't left see be on the ride If I could have spoken back then I'd have said we'd be all right well, This trip is a long one It's all that we had it's so good to see you I see that 
there's this thing we joke about in me sometimes that we're joy hustlers, spirit lifting. People come in and you feel like your job is to just, just lift people a little bit, you know, if you can. He really likes to do that. No matter where he's at, and he goes out and he just absolutely slays it. He gives it all. He's one of the most loyal people I know. He's got a big heart, he'd do anything for you. So, yeah. That boy there is, he's gonna be a great New Zealander one day. He's, he's laying down the, he's laying down the legacy at the moment. The best songs have empathy in it, right? And love, it's fucking all about love, man. Love's gotta be in there somewhere. And I've spent a lot of my time real angry, you know, real dark, real depressed, real manic, you know, or real broken in my soul. And songs help you, they lift you from that. And um, so, but they do that because they have love in them, you know. And so if I'm good and I'm hitting it and I'm really in it, then yeah, it feels real good. Thank you very much. Thank you.